We're talking about tech stocks, both domestic and foreign, with Thomas Hayes, managing member of Great Hill Capital. Welcome back to the show, Thomas. Thanks for having me back, David. Let's start with China. So China, and like the NASDAQ, the eight shares index has not had a very good run this year. Break down what happened over the course of uh, the last eight months and uh, the forces you're looking at right now. Yeah, so we have a situation here with the China crackdown, uh, regular situation of sell the rumor, buy the news. So we've had this consistent uh, worry about a Chinese crackdown. The market has been able, unable to quantify the magnitude of that crackdown. And then we got some acute events like the education sector in China uh, that really threw managers for a loop. And now we're getting really close to and at the point of buy the news. So it was the fear of the rumors of all these crackdowns. And now, as of last week, we got the five-year plan announced where they're going to strengthen control on tech companies and healthcare companies as it relates to data. On Friday, we got the PIPL, which is the Personal Information Protection Plan, which uh, identifies how we deal with, uh, they deal with the data privacy. And this is very similar to the rules in the EU the GDPR. So many people have been afraid of this, but this type of regulation exists around the world and China is now just catching up and starting to put this type of stuff in place. And I would say, David, we had a very similar situation. It seems like every three to five years, the Chinese government feels like they lose a little bit of control and they get concerned and they uh, overshoot on the reaction standpoint and the regulation standpoint. So to give you an idea, in 2018 was the most recent crackdown. Uh, this, uh, this was related to the online gamers. They stopped approving uh, the, the new online games. They felt that it was hurting children. Uh, similar to some, some rhetoric that we've heard in, in recent weeks about the spiritual opium, they, they uh, identified the video games. And what happened over this period in 2018, as everyone was worried about this crackdown and the shutdown, Tencent fell uh, 50% in nine months over the, the fears, the, the rumors of the crackdown. And then once the crackdown happened, it rallied 216% over the next two years. NetEase fell 50% also in the nine months, uh, the sell the rumor. And then by the news, it rallied 288% over the next two years. And Alibaba was down 40%, even though they didn't have as high a concentration in the online gaming. They all fell in sympathy uh, because capital goes where it's treated best. And uh, foreign investors felt that the, the Chinese government was going overboard. They pulled out just like we've seen them pull out in the last six months in the US and acutely in the last two months. And after that 40% correction of Baba, it rallied 150% over the next two years. So it's a very similar situation very similar overshoot on the crackdown, but ultimately the growth is going to be there. And we think that we're at that point, uh, if not already at the buy the news where the, where the market can now quantify the regulation, quantify the risk, quantify the impact that'll have on earnings and, and move forward. You mentioned the key word earlier, which is control. So yes, some of these regulations are reminiscent of what the uh, other jurisdictions around the world, like, like the EU and the US, have already put in place with their stock markets. Now, the hysteria around these regulations is how far the Chinese government can go in terms of the control. Are you, at, uh, are you concerned about the risk of nationalization or tighter grips on uh, oversight at all? Well, there's no question. I mean, if, if you look at the cascade of events and the timeline, David, uh, first off, uh, uh, Jack Ma went missing last year. Everyone says, where is Jack Ma? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the founder of Alibaba, co-founder. And uh, so, that, so that was worrisome. Then you had the Ant Financial IPO delayed. That was supposed to go public uh, late last year. Alibaba owns a third of that. Then you had uh, earlier this year, Alibaba was fined $2.7 billion for anti-monopolistic practices. And then July is what, what shocked everyone, which is when the Chinese government basically uh, turned the education companies and the education stocks into effectively nonprofit companies where they limited the hours that they could uh, teach the children and offer courses. They uh, prohibited it on Sundays. And it's interesting because 
uh, there was a lot of backlash to this because uh, the Chinese government was trying to incentivize parents to have children, and they felt that it was becoming too costly to raise children because of the tutoring and everything else. Uh, and uh, you know, the parents actually became up in arms over cracking down on the uh, tutors because they want their children to be properly educated. They want them to have good high paying jobs like at an Alibaba, like at a Tencent, like at a NetEase, uh, like at a JD. And they don't want them to uh, just, you know, kind of uh, go willy nilly and then wind up in a factory job or in a job that's uh, less attractive. So uh, what Chinese parents want to see is opportunity for their children to have great jobs moving forward. So sometimes these crackdowns overshoot. And I think we're going to see some walk back a little bit on the education stocks. The parents are demanding it. And I think you're going to see some walk back on the 10 cents, the JDs, the Alibabas, as we saw in 2018, because that's the future of the country. That's what parents have to look forward to. And if there are a lot of high paying professional jobs, then it's there's an incentive to invest and to have the children and to uh, make sure that they're going to have a better future. But when the Chinese, you know, it is an entrepreneurial culture. When the Chinese government over cracks down, the future looks less bright. And that's going to deter parents from having more children, which is absolutely necessary for the China's uh, goals moving forward. If you remember, in the late 80s, Japan faced a similar demographic headwind. They were projected, they were buying up Rockefeller Center in New York City uh, in the late 80, mid 80s, and everyone thought that they were going to become the largest economy in the world. Uh, but they stopped having children, and that aging population was a demographic cliff that they still haven't basically recovered from uh, in more than uh, now we're, we're going on three decades. And China is definitely afraid that they're going to fall to a similar fate uh, by the hand of their own policies, which was the one child, then they moved up to two child children. And most recently, they said, uh, you know, we're going to walk it back. If you want to have three children, you could have three children. They're, they're trying to catch up for lost time because yeah. they know the fate that awaits them if they don't make changes quickly. Well, that's true. But they, uh, keep in mind, even if China stops growing for a while, they've still got a billion people versus Japan, yeah. which has got a tenth of that population uh, back in the, uh, well, even now, but back in the 80s especially. But uh, good point yeah. you brought up, Thomas. Uh, let's talk about uh, stocks from an investor's perspective. Now, you mentioned that now might be a good time to get back in. So let's talk about that. Let's take Alibaba, for example. I'm looking at the share price. It's at $167. If you take a look at the uh, listing on the NASDAQ. Now, that's down 44% from its October highs last year. Are you looking at this and saying to yourself, this looks attractive from a valuation perspective, or do you still think the risk premium is too high, given all the geopolitical risks we've discussed? Yeah, I, I think Alibaba is one of the best bar bargains in the entire market. Can I say that this is the absolute bottom or not? I have no idea. Uh, but on red days, we, we continue to add to this position. And on green days, we just continue to ride it. But you know, you're in good company on this stock. I mean, you saw earlier this year, uh, Charlie Munger uh, made it 17.5% of his portfolio at the Daily Journal, uh, which is a very big, a big position. Other major value players, Monish Prabhai, uh, is 21% of his portfolio. Bill Miller has a big position uh, of Miller Value, and, and Ray Dalio has a position, and he forgot more about China than we'll ever know. He's been going there for the last three decades. And he said, listen, you need to look through this because the growth opportunity in China is too big to ignore. So, uh, you know, th those certainly being in good company is one thing that's, uh, you know, nice ancillary benefit. But the key is the business. Uh, you can buy Alibaba today uh, less expensively than you could buy it three years ago. The difference is, is uh, revenues per share, earnings per share and cash flow per share have all doubled over the last three years. So you're getting double the business for the same price. Uh, and you know people will say, well, the regulation is gonna, gonna slow down their, their earnings growth and therefore you have to apply uh, a lower multiple. And I think the opposite is true. What we find is that when governments around the world regulate big tech, what it does is it locks in their competitive moat by making it harder and harder for smaller players to pay for compliance, they wind up going by the wayside or being absorbed by the bigger players, and it just creates a greater monopolistic moat. And uh, you know, uh, one way to think about it, you could also think about big oil in this way, is kind of like the cigarette stocks. Uh, Philip Morris and Altria over the last two decades have been top performers because the the government regulated away their comp their competition and created a a moat. 
Uh, I think you're going to see a similar situation in big tech around the world. Uh, the more regulation, the more compliance around data, uh, the, the bigger the competitive advantage that these big players are going to have. So, you know, maybe a half a step back, as we've seen in, in terms of the price, but five or 10 steps forward. And, uh, and there's no question, you know, China, although they've taken actions in the short term that are against their own self-interest, uh, in the intermediate to long term, they're going to need to champion their big players if they want to be globally competitive. You've seen Europe take the opposite tact and over-regulate, and therefore they have no tech leaders. They have no real tech innovation compared to the US and compared to China. And the other thing the Chinese government is going to figure out sooner or later is the more they regulate Alibaba, JD, Tencent, the more they just shovel money to Silicon Valley and, and, and uh, you know, the big tech in Silicon Valley is very happy to capture all the market share that China wants to give them uh, by beating up their own uh, champions. And, uh, and sooner or later, they're going to realize maybe they've overshot. And I think they've also realized in the short term that they've overshot in terms of capital flight. You know, God forbid they they really overstep and they got right on the skinny branches with what they did to the education stop stocks and money flows out. You know, when all that money starts to flow out and it impairs the ability of their companies to grow, uh, you're going to start to see if this were to persist layoffs of tens and hundreds of thousands of highly paid professionals in China, which could lead to a situation a uh, historic situation that they don't want to see. So, so the efforts they're taking to, to insert and instill control may actually wind up with them losing control. And uh, they haven't gone quite that far, and they seem to be walking it back now. We've seen in recent days where they've not only put out the rules for the personal information, they've put out the, the rules for uh, uh, foreign Chinese companies to become foreign IPOs, which everyone was worried about. They have to abide by national laws and regulations and security of personal data. So they're starting to quantify what they want to see in regulation. And once the market comes to grips with what they want to see, then they say, okay, these are the new rules and, and, and that's how we play. And then the stocks can start to get bid and capital can feel comfortable coming back to invest in these businesses. And they can start to, to uh, revert back to their intrinsic value in the case of Alibaba. I think that's going to work its way back up to $300 over the next couple of years. In terms of regulations, just to sum up, do you think the market's overreacted then to what's been happening in the news? Keep in mind, however, yeah. that the uh, Chinese stocks, the H shares index, Alibaba tech stocks, they've been falling since the start of, uh, start of the year. Yeah. Well, again, it was, you know, the crackdown started last year with Ma and then, um, you know, with the fear of the, of the crackdowns, with the fines, with the delay of the Ant financial IPO with the rumors of what they were going to do, the education stock, uh, you know, they came very, very close to really uh, scaring off foreign capital for the long term with what they did with the education stocks. That's nothing to, uh, you know, overlook. And I think uh, investors will come back with some trepidation. But the more rules the Chinese government lays out and specificity, the more comfort investors will come uh, confidence that they'll have coming back. I will say in terms of let's talk about the overshoot and the fundamentals. So the KWEB, which is the Chinese internet ETF, uh, we looked at the top 28 holdings of the KWEB, the top 28 weights. And what we saw in the last 60 days, uh, the 2021 earnings estimates have come down by about 3.6%, and the 2022 earnings estimates have come down by 3.04%. So, uh, you know, Analysts, a consensus analysts have been taking down earnings estimates over the last six days, but just about 3%. The price of the KWEB ETF over that exact same period has come down 40%. And that is where, you know, we've made our career is in identifying those divergences and dislocations and, and, and looking for the reversion to the mean. So while earnings could come down a little bit more than 3%, and they probably will, maybe they'll come down 5%, maybe they'll come down 10%, price is overshot 40%. And what that tells you is you had a structural dislocation and liquidation. So you have funds liquidating, uh, funds getting out, uh, hedge funds getting redemptions, emerging market funds figuring out what to do, 
and and you saw that that type of uh, capitulation and disorderly selling, particularly last week until we started to get the rules out. And then uh, today you saw the Chinese central bank come out and say that we want to have a high quality economic expansion and we are going to provide appropriate money growth to facilitate that. So they basically realized that they've kind of overshot, they've scared away a lot of foreign capital. And now they say, have to kind of backtrack and say, here are the new rules. We are going to become an accommodative economy. And if your money comes back, you're going to see benefits. Oh, and by the way, we're going to allow foreign IPOs of Chinese companies again. We do want your capital, uh, but we're going to make sure our companies abide by these two things. We don't want to give up uh, uh, personal data, and we need you to abide by our domestic laws at the same time. And if those two things are followed, everything will be back to normal. But the, you know, the worry about this VIE structure and everything, this is nothing new. You know, you've always had that risk for the last 20 years since Sohu and NetEase went public. Uh, every time the Chinese stock market goes down 40 or 50% because the Chinese government overreaches, uh, everyone says, oh, the VIE structure is at risk. Maybe this time's different, but I bet it's probably more similar to the last five or six times over the last 20 years where everyone gets scared and then you know business goes back to normal because both sides realize it's in their interest to continue to do business together. Let's just compare apples to apples. We're trying to compare apples to apples here now. Uh, Fang stocks versus the top Chinese stocks. So JD, Alibaba, Baidu, which are a better bargain in your, in your opinion? Yeah, well, you know, you've seen an interesting year. So the, the first quarter of this year, you had the reopening trade. Uh, you had rates going up uh, ex extremely fast. You saw a 69 basis point move in the 10-year yield in the first quarter, about six weeks, six-week period from 100 basis points to like 169 basis points. And energy stocks, bank stocks, industrial stocks, material stocks, they all ripped. They had historic moves uh, like we haven't seen in a long time. And then once rates backed off into the mid second quarter around uh, late May, early July, uh, it was time once that rate of change slowed and then actually the 10 year started to, to roll over, 10 year yield started to roll over, it was the time to get into uh, tech. The long duration earnings and the long duration assets like FANGs that have promises of future earnings growth down the road when rates are lower, they do better and they get higher multiples. When rates start to rise, the, those future cash flows become much less valuable and those stocks start to come in. So I do think that uh, you know, uh, FANG has, has some legs in it. I think some of these uh, uh, lately out of favor stocks like the Netflixes and the Amazons may have room to run. Uh, you know, the Googles and the Facebooks, they've had monster, monster runs here. So I think it's it's a little bit nuanced for tech, but what I would keep my eye on is for late Q3 and certainly Q4, a resurgence of the reopening trade and the move to value. I think as the market starts to sniff out the implementation of taper, which is most likely an early 2022 event as far as the impl imp implementation the announcement, maybe we'll get in September. I, I, I don't think anyone's expecting it in Jackson Hole anymore, but September and November, you get the announcement. And the market will start to sniff that out. The other thing that's going to help the reopening trade that might put a little um, headwind in some of the FANG stocks that have already run quite a bit is the seasonality of the treasury bond market. So uh, treasuries have a seasonal tendency uh, over the last 20 years to start to sell off in the August, September, October period and yields start to rise. So again, that's gonna favor the value and the reopening uh, trade as well. We're also seeing it in the weekly commitments of traders report that the commercials have been net sellers of treasuries of late and they tend to get ahead of uh, trends and they tend to be right. So uh, we're probably gonna see commercials selling more and eventually those yields start to tick back up uh, in the back half, which again helps the value and the reopening trade. So, so that's how we're thinking about it at, at this point. And just to close off now, so if you were to take the top Chinese stocks versus uh, Facebook, Amazon, the FANG stocks, uh, which do you think, which group would you think have or has the highest growth potential over the next one year? Yeah, I think without question, uh, you know, you're going to certainly have much greater volatility in the short term. 
and much greater risk in the short term, headline risk in the short term. But these Chinese stocks, again, you know, to see just in the basket, uh, estimates come down 3% and price come down 40% just in the last two months. These are, these are the kind of career opportunities that don't come around very often mm -hmm. uh, that you can buy high quality growth at, at, a, at a dislocated price. And, uh, you know, when, you know, as Warren Buffett says, when it rains gold, you got to put out the bucket, not the thimble. And I think that's what we have here. Obviously, you have to be careful and you have to hedge by your sizing. Uh, because the head, you know, the the rules can change, and you can get headlines that can impact it. But the growth of these companies that, and you got to go the highest quality, the ten cents, the Alibabas, the JDs, uh, et cetera, maybe the Netties. A basket of those, you could see moves in the next twelve to twenty four months as as the floor gets put in and the bottoming process gets worked through. You know, some of these are going to be up. They're they're they're. 50% below their consensus price targets. And those targets yeah. may come down, but you know, I don't think you're going to see FANG in aggregate up 50 to 75% over the next 12 to 24 months. And some of these Chinese stocks will be up 100% uh, probably over the next 24 to 36 months. So mm -hmm. for my money, I, I think it's a better risk reward. I don't think you want to be either or. I do think there's opportunity in the Amazons and the Netflix with their new content slate on the Netflix side. But I would start to probably uh, tiptoe back in and get exposure for the best quality Chinese stocks because they've just been bludgeoned and yeah. the, the Chinese government is making signals that they, they want that to stop and they want to yeah. move forward. Excellent. Well, let's focus more on the uh, U.S. side next time. Excellent thoughts as always. Thomas, thank you so much for coming on today. Thanks for having me, David. And thank you for watching Kiko News. Don't forget to subscribe and follow me on Twitter at DavidLin underscore TV.